Who am I? Am I what I do? An artist? An accountant? A teacher? A mother? Or am I what I've achieved? An honor student? An MVP? A winner? Am I the things I've done right? Or am I defined by the things I've done wrong? Am I a saint? A sinner? What about what others think of me? Am I all of these things? None of these things? Who am I? How I identify myself determines how I approach life. If I am what I do, I'll always need to do more and achieve more to find my value. If I am what others say, I'll always try to please people instead of my Heavenly Father. But if I listen to who God says I am and embrace His identity in me, I'll find the freedom to live out all He has planned for me. Do you find it amazing sometimes that we come upon a season or a situation that so, can be so overwhelming and so daunting that we, it, it, it forces us into this place of shock to where we just forget altogether who God is and what He can do. It's like our mind just goes blank and we forget how big God is and how capable God is. And there's moments where maybe you, you find yourself in life and you're in a field and you're, you're introduced to a, a, a new giant. You don't know this one. You've never met this one before. And, 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 and you, you tend to forget that God is the God who anointed you to slay the giant before this one. But you totally right. forget about it. You, you, you get to a point to where you feel like the entire world is, is caving in on you. But we forget that God is the God who created the world. That's right. We feel like we're losing our cotton-picking mind sometimes, but we forget that God formed our mind That's right. along with our inner parts while in our mother's womb. And while He was at it, He gave us a hope and he gave us a purpose, he gave us a destiny, and he called it good. We right. forget who he is, and how big he is, and how awesome he is. Think about the wisdom that God has. Think about what he knows. Think about what he can do. Think about the power of his words. When he says something is the way that it is, it has no choice but to be. That That's right. He has the power of, of creation and he has the power of destruction. He has the power to speak to those who are dead like Lazarus and yeah. speak to them and say, Lazarus, come forth. That's right. And death has to respond to the authority and the voice yeah. of God. That's he right. has the power to speak to those things that are not as though they are. Whatever he says, it has to be. Right. He holds all authority. He holds our future in His hands. He is all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing. good. And so, when we snap out of this amnesia and we remember how big He is and how capable He is, shouldn't we ask Him who He says we are? Last week, we asked the question, God, I mean, here I am, completely overwhelmed. I, I don't even know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm immobilized. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm, I'm just paralyzed. And then he says to us, he says, who do you say I am? Are, are you forgetting who I am? Yeah. But oftentimes, we need to realize who we are in him. We're talking about identity. We need to know who we are in him because when we get... When we get a glimpse of who we are in Him, then our identity takes a shape, and it's a healthy shape. It's, it's the shape of a healthy reality. Okay. It's not about what we think of ourselves, but it's about what God thinks about us, because all that matters is what God thinks and what God says. Right. Amen? It's true. Amen. So today, we're going we're gonna to take a glimpse into the reality of who you and I really are. Yeah. And in order to do that, we're going to dig into the Word of God today in, in, in John chapter 8. And if you have your Bible today, you can begin turning there. But I want to kind of set the scene here. Jesus, he's, we're dealing with identity, okay? To set this up, Jesus is, he's at the temple in, in Jerusalem, and he is speaking to a large mixed crowd 
Some of the crowd are believers, they're church people. Some of them are not so churched people. Some of them uh, are absolutely uh, not church people uh, because they want to kill him, but yet they go to church, if you can wrap your mind around that. (laughs) They are religious leaders, they hate him, and they're trying to set him up to try to kill him because he is bad for business. Can you say that? Bad Bad for business. He was really, really bad for business. So here he is speaking to this crowd and he begins to set the stage for how you and I can begin to understand and realize our identity in him. So he's speaking to them and he says, he says, look, um, and here's what's really interesting is he's speaking to those who believed in him. I want you, as you're taking notes this morning, I want you to pay attention to these little details because it's so interesting as he begins to unfold this purpose in, in who we are. He says, if you, if you believe in me, you are truly my disciples if, now circle that word if, because yeah. it becomes a conditional clause. When you say if, it means, okay, there's a condition attached to what he is about to say. Right. If you want to know that you know that you know that you belong to me, that you're part of the family of God. If you really want to know that you're good with God, what I'm about to say is really important and you need to pay attention to it. I want you, he said, to remain faithful. Can you say that with me? Remain Faithful. faithful. I want you to remain faithful to my teachings. Everything that Jesus had taught them while he was traveling and ministering, everything now that we read in the Word of God written and read, I want you to remain faithful. I want you to be committed. I want you to be dedicated. I want you to just dig in and eat this for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't want you to ever, ever, ever turn your back on the Word of God because there's something here that I have for you. There's something that you really need to understand because the Word of God is the pathway to something greater than you can possibly understand or fathom or think for yourself. As we remain faithful to his teachings. Think about this. That word faithful. We, we, I don't think that we understand the significance of really what that means. To remain faithful. To remain, to remain dedicated. To, to dig in. To begin to press in to the presence of God like we never have before. He, he, he goes on. And I, I want to read this, this full text so you can just kind of grasp it this morning. He says, if, if, if you... Call yourselves my disciples, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth is going to do what? It's going to set you free. If you remain faithful faithful to my teachings, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When we hear that word truth at at, at face value in our American culture, we think it's the opposite of a lie. And, And yeah, I mean, there's some truth to that, but that's not what he was saying here. That's right. He was saying here that he is the truth. I I want you to get this this morning. Jesus says that he is the truth and he is the word of God. If you've ever read John chapter 1, it says this. In the beginning, ready, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So what he's telling us today is not only is he the truth, but he's also the word. What on earth are you talking about, pastor? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. When we come to know him, when we come to know the truth, there's a shift that takes place. There's something that happens that that maybe you've never experienced before. I, I, I liken it to this, that, you know, in a marriage relationship, it's different than when you're dating. When you're dating somebody, you, you learn to, you get to know them. I mean, you start dating, you, you, you go hang out, you go to the movies, you, you go out and you do stuff together and you become friends and you develop this relationship and you really start enjoying spending time together and being together and, and you have this great dating relationship. But then when you decide, hey, let's get married. And you make that commitment, and, and, and on, the, on the night 
of your, of your, of your wedding, when, when the consummation of that marriage takes place, there's something that happens. No longer do you know each other as friends. No longer do you know each other at face value, but now you know each other at a deeper, more intimate level than you've ever known each other before. That's right. It's intimate. It's deep. It's meaningful. It's different. It's, it really is supernatural. Yeah. And, and what God's saying is here, I want you to know the truth. I want you to know me. So okay. the, the, the deeper you get into my presence, the, the, the deeper you dig into the word of God, the more you will figure out who I am. That's right. Get this. The more you figure out who I am, the deeper you get into my presence, the more you're going to realize, listen, who you are. Are. And right. here's why. Because God, right, don't miss it. God created you and I. That's right. He gave us a hope. He formed us. He molded us. He, he made us. He, he, yeah. he is the one. It's because of Him and it's only because of Him that you and I exist. That's right. And so the same, the same being, God, who created us, does He not know us better than anybody else? Yeah. The Bible says that we're spirits and so is God. God is a spirit as well. And nobody knows a spirit better than a spirit. God knows you. That's he right. knows your thoughts. He knows your desires. He knows your, your flub-ups. He knows it all. That's right. Nobody knows Him. Nobody knows you better than He knows you. So if you want to really know yourself, if you want to really know who you are, then you need to get to that place in the deepest part of God's heart where you just press into His presence through His Word. And you get to that place, the deepest part of His heart, and you finally arrive to this place where you will find a mirror because we were made in the image and in the likeness of Him. That's right. And so we get to this place and we're forced to look in this mirror and see the reflection of ourselves. But in, in, in God's truth, he reveals to us who we really are. That's right. He reveals to us where we're really at. And his desire more than anything is that that truth would reveal more than anything who he says we are yeah. and who he wants us to be because there's a difference. Right. You see, when I look in this mirror, I don't see the same person that God does. That's right. No. I see a person that's made a lot of mistakes. I see a person that's not worthy. Yeah. See a person that's not worthy of being chosen or called or used or forgiven of my sins. I see somebody there, but that's not who God sees. That's right. And when you look in that mirror in the heart of God, He's going to show you exactly who you really are. And it's important that we understand who we are in Him right. because it forms our identity. And when we realize who we are in Him, then we begin to understand what we can do through Him. Right. And it changes yeah. everything. It's good. It changes our perspective on our right. entire life to be able to see what we're capable of, not because of us, but because of Him. It's good. And when we get to this point to where we see the truth, of who we are and what He says about us and who He says we are, then the truth, the reality, His reality, right. will set you free. Give Him praise right. today. That's right. Woo How many of you guys have ever been in a conversation and you're like talking to one person and somebody just butts in? You ever had that happen? It's kind of aggravating, right? When I, was a, when I was a teenager, we used to like have conversation. Somebody would do that. And we would say, you know, this is an A-B conversation. You need to see your way out of it, right? That's so it's, rude. It's so old school. So don't use it, parents, okay? I said that to my kids one time, and they were like, you are so old. Like, <laughs> okay, what's cool? That wasn't. Okay, so the very next part of this passage, that's what happens, okay? Brad told you that when Jesus was teaching, there was three different groups of people in there. There were people who believed in Jesus, okay? They're following, I mean, they're hanging on every word like you are when we speak, right? I hope. They're hanging on every word Jesus says. And then there's those who they are not sure about this whole Jesus thing, okay? They're trying to figure it out. They really haven't become a follower or a believer of Jesus. And then you have those who are outright against him, and those are the Pharisees, okay? Those are the ones who want him dead. Well, it's the Pharisees that pipe up, which is really interesting because Jesus wasn't talking to them. Okay, Jesus was talking in verse 31, it said he was talking to those who believed. 
So everything he was about to say wasn't for the ones who didn't believe, and it wasn't for sure for the ones who wanted him dead. It was for the believers. But notice what they pipe up and say, okay? Again, it says in verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 33 says it this way, but we are descendants of Abraham, they said. This is the Pharisees. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Now, what's interesting about this, okay, it's very comical when you read this and you understand it. They, at this moment, though he's not talking to them, they get defensive. Why do you ever get defensive when someone's talking to you? Generally, if you get defensive, it's because you either feel a little bit of conviction or a little bit of like, maybe you're trying to like step on my toes. Maybe, you know, if you're a wife and your husband's like, you're a hag and you're like, Ugh. you know, you get I have really not said that defensive. T- today. Oh, okay. I was like, Whoo, let's not lie in church. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you say those words, the other person, it's so harsh. Okay. It's so harsh that they don't have the opportunity to take it in and honestly apply it what they're doing is immediately coming to the defense of themselves and that's what the pharisees were doing they were saying whoa 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 we are not in bondage we have never been in bondage it would be like i am not a hag nor have i ever been a hag okay and if you really take a step back you're like well there was those few moments you know when i might have been a little haggish so you have to have a reality check okay And so in this moment, what they're saying is we've never been in bondage. But if you go back and you look at the history of the children of Israel, which is where the Pharisees came from, do you remember how they were enslaved in Egypt for how many years? 400 years. Brett talked about it last week. God raises up Moses, this deliverer. He delivers them. They go out. They start living for God. And then what happens? They start to do their own thing. And so then they end up in bondage to Babylon for 75 years. And then they're in in bondage to the Macedonians. And then at this very moment, they are in bondage to the Romans. All right? They They are right now under Roman rule. They are not free people. And yet they say, we've never been slaves. We don't need to be set free. We don't have a problem. Have you ever been in there when somebody is saying, hey, I can help you with this little area of your life? And you're like, I don't need your help. You sure about that? No, I don't have a problem. I I don't have a problem. That's what they were saying. And Jesus goes on to say this. He replies to their defense and he says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, what he's talking about in this moment is continuing in sin. He's not talking about the fact that you were born into it, but those who continue to sin, they are slaves to sin sin. And this slave, the word literally means bondservant or one who chooses to remain enslaved. All right. So it's someone just like the Pharisees who they're hearing Jesus say, I'll set you free. And they're like, no, 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 I don't need that because I'm not bound. Now, what's interesting about this I remember when I was a kid growing up, we'd go to circuses. Anybody gone to a circus? Or there's that awesome movie. Um, what is it, Brad? The girls love it. Oh, the Greatest, greatest showman. showman. Yes. Okay. The other night, I'm in my bedroom on the other end of the house, and I hear this blaring music on the other end. And at the same time, I hear two kids singing, a boy and a girl, which is awkward because we have four teenagers and they generally don't get along. So to hear two of them singing together, I had to leave my room to go figure out what was going on. I open up my blonde boy's door. All right, if you don't know the blonde boy, you can figure it out later. But I open up his door, and him and his sister Blake, which generally bump heads, are blaring singing at the top this of their lungs. Yeah, whatever they that were song is. It. They were rocking out in his bedroom. <laughs> and I was like, cool, shut the door and left. You know what I mean? I'm like, you're kidding along. It's awesome. Well, you know, growing up, I loved going to the circus. I liked going and looking at the animals and watching all the acrobats. But one thing I really loved, and my dad always loved it, was the elephant show. When they would come out with these ginormous animals, and I'm always amazed that those animals had the power and strength to destroy everything. I mean, that whole circus tent and all the people, but they didn't. I never one time saw an elephant go crazy. They came out. They did exactly what they were told to do. They put on a good show. Everybody clapped, and out they would go. And when you really begin to look and study how did humans ever train elephants, these ginormous animals, to do that, it's very interesting, has a lot to do with bondage. I'm going to show you kind of this morning how they do it. 
So if Brattle put this on, okay, do you ever feel like you're in bondage, babe? I'm about to. Okay. The day you said I do, you're like, no. <laughs> All right. So when elephants are babies, they take a rope and they tie it around the elephant's leg and they stake it down. All right? And when this elephant is a baby, it really can't get off, okay? So it tries because that is just annoying. It's like putting your kid in a high chair. They're just really annoyed and they want to go away. And so the baby elephant tries and tries and tries, but it just can't do it, all right? So day after day after day, the elephant gets staked down, and day after day after day, it gets frustrated trying until finally it just decides, I give up. I'm this done. is my life. I'm stuck right here where this human put me. This is all I'm going to do. And one day, the humans, this is really what they do, they untie it from the stake. And although the elephant could just walk away, they don't. And although even if I tied the stake back, even if I tied the rope back to the stake right here, that elephant, by the time it's full grown, could bust that little rope in just a second and take off doing its own thing. But it's been trained to know that it was stuck right here. Why? Because of bondage, because of this rope. And the fact is, is that so often we are bound up because the enemy has us so convinced that, you know what, you've tried and you failed. You'll never be anything more than what you are right now. You'll never be anything more than what people say you are and what has happened to you has determined who you become. And he keeps you tied up in chains. You're so oppressed that, honestly, bondage has become very normal to you. And that's what was going on in the Pharisees' lives. They were so bound that they didn't even have the eyes to say, I admit, we are bound and we need to be set free. Rather, they had the rope tied around their foot and they're just staying put. Why? Because bondage had become normal in their life. Mm. But what's interesting, when you go on and you read the next part, Jesus says this, a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. If the son, notice if you're looking here at at your Bible or on the screen, you're going to notice the second son is with a capital S, okay? So we're talking about Jesus. So if the Son, Jesus, sets you free, you are truly free. Now, the reason that Jesus is talking about slavery in this culture is because it was very normal. Almost everybody had slaves, okay? And so during that day and time, a lot of of times, if a wife could not have children, the husband would marry, take another wife, and he would marry the maidservant or the slave girl of his wife, okay? And he would have children through her. Well, in that culture, if you had taken a maidservant as your wife and you had a son, the maidservant continues to be your slave, even though she's your wife now. She's still in bondage. She's still a slave. But the son of the slave woman is free. Now, follow me. In that day and time, at the same time, if the husband were to pass away, you got mom who's a slave and a son who is free, the only person who had the authority to set the woman free, the mom, the maidservant free, was the son. Mm -hmm. You go back and you read this passage, now you can understand what was Jesus really trying to tell them. He was trying to say, look here, my mom is Mary, a slave woman to sin. She was a human, meaning she was born into sin just like we were. She was a slave. But what you don't understand is that I'm the son of God. And because I'm the son of God, I am a free son. And I am the only one who has the right and has the power and has the authority to free you, to loose the chains that are binding you right now, to set you free. But you won't even have it. Why? Because you've gotten so used to the loose, the noose that's around your leg. You've gotten so used to it. You haven't even realized you have a problem because bondage is just simply normal. And when you look in the mirror, you can't say, I'm chosen, I'm forgiven, I'm adopted. God has a plan for my life. I'm made in the image of God. Rather, what you see is I'm damaged goods. I'm not valuable. I'm all the things that somebody has ever said about me. And every time you look in the mirror, you feel broken to the point of walking away from it because you know that, you know what? Due to my past, there's no way I have any kind of a future because I am still tied up and I'm bound. And it's just become simply normal. Amen. 
when I was when I was 12 years old, I invited Christ to to live in my heart. Um, but when I was 20, I made Him Lord of my life, and there's a big difference. That's right. When I was 12, I said, Jesus, I welcome you to come in, and now let's let's see what happens here. And it was rough. It was rough from the time I was 12 to the time I was 20. It was so hard to live for God. It was so, I went so far off the, the beaten path. I went so far off. I can't even believe that I somehow found my way back. But here I am, 20 years old, and I, I say, Lord, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with religion. And I want relationship and I'm going to give you everything I have. So I made a a determination I was going to be in the house of God every single time the doors were open. And and it wasn't long. I I was attending this church in uh, Jeff City, Missouri. And I I became friends with the pastor's sons. He had four sons and a daughter. And I just became, very quickly, just became like family to them. And and before I knew it, I found myself over at their house. Every time they ate dinner, I seemed to just show up. I don't know what it was. but, but, But I was there all the time I would stay the night there all the time and they would have family nights I was there they'd have birthday parties I was there they would have Christmas I was there what'd you get me I'm family now I mean I I they they literally took me under their wings and they adopted me and they allowed me to become a part of their family and my last name was not their last name yeah and, and I just, I see the goodness of God just being poured out in my life, in this season of my life. And I, I'm starting to actually live for God. I'm actually starting to run from sin and I'm starting to, to strive to please Him in everything I say, do, and think. And I'm, I'm turning into a different person. But the, okay. the more I, I look in the mirror and I think about who I am and, and what I've done, I, I, I can't stop thinking about how I'm so not worthy of being loved like this. I'm so not worthy of this family taking me under their wings and adopting me and calling me a son of their own yeah. and treating me the way that they are and helping me to learn how to live for God. I just, okay. I'm not worthy. I'm just not. But they helped me to see who God said I was. That's good. They helped me to realize that the way I was feeling about myself, the, the, the rope that I had tied to my foot, I'm, they helped me to realize that it was, it was a lie. That's right. That I was now big enough, I was now strong enough in my yeah. faith that I could easily snap this rope in two. I could easily yeah. escape from good. the life that I had been living. And they helped me, they helped me so much to identify with my real identity in Christ. Good. And when that happened, something shifted in my life. And I learned that even though, even though I, I, I was saved, I gave my heart to God, I was still allowing myself to be bound by so many things. And maybe you're a believer today, Come on. but you're still allowing yourself to be bound. Come on. Maybe you're a believer, but you're bound by pornography. Yeah. Maybe you're a, a, a believer, but you're bound by, by, by a by horrible temper. Maybe you have addictions in your life. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are things, they just have a grip on you, and you just allow yourself to continually be bound by this lie when the truth is God has called you to greater things than what right. you're living and what you're experiencing Amen. because of who He okay. is inside of you. Do you Good. not understand Amen. who you really are right. in Him? Good. He Talk wants to you to know who you are right. because when you realize who you are, you'll begin to realize what you can do That's because right. of who He is. Good. You need yeah. to learn. You need to begin to understand so what God says about you. I think about King David. And I think about how King David finds himself, you know, his, God has just blessed his life and he begins to ask God this question. He says, God, God, who, who am I? Who am I, mm-hmm. who am I that, 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 that you would be so kind, that you'd be so kind to my family, God? Oh, sovereign Lord, that you've brought me this far. And then we see Moses saying the same thing. Moses is is protesting with God and he says, God, who am I that you would call me to appear before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that I would demand that he would set your people free, that you would use somebody like me to deliver millions and millions and millions of people that have been in slavery for 400 years. Who am I that you would use me to do something so much bigger than myself? 
when you realize that it's not you, but it's him who lives inside of you, then that changes everything. When you look in the mirror and you realize who you really are, then you realize that this rope is nothing but a piece of yarn. That's right. And then you can snap it in half and that you are truly free because the son has made you free. You have to understand who God says you are. In 1 Peter 2 and 9, he says, you are a chosen people. That's right. You're chosen. Yes. You're royal. Yeah. You're holy. You're special. He says, I've called you out of darkness into my marvelous light. That's right. Is it because of anything you've done? Is there anything you could have ever done to have earned the goodness of God? No to way. call you out of darkness into his light? No. no. There's nothing you will ever do to earn the sure. favor of God in your life. But it's because of who he is. Yes. And you need to look in the mirror in the deepest part of his heart and see the truth about who he says you are. Ephesians 1 and 5 says, God decided in advance, check this out, to adopt you into his family. That's right. Man, let that sink in just for a second. He didn't have to. Yeah. But he chose to call you a son and a daughter of God. That's right. You see, without him, we were hopeless. Yeah, we're nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying today, church? Without Jesus, we had no hope. That's right. Because of sin in this world, Mm -hmm. death, doom, despair. That 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 was that was our future. But because of Jesus, because of what He's done, He's given us a future and a hope, and He calls us sons and daughters of God. We're not strangers, we're not foreigners, we're not slaves. We belong to Him. You are worthy of being adopted. He loves you and He's chosen you for something bigger than this. That's right. He's chosen you. This is what he wanted to do and he gave, it gave him great pleasure. In 1 yeah. Peter 2 and 9, he calls us special, right? He calls us hand-picked, created, uh, who created the universe. He calls, in Deuteronomy, he calls us treasured. In 1 Thessalonians, he says that you're irreplaceable. In, in 1 John, he says that you're loved beyond compare. Uh, he also says that you're worthy of dying for. In Ephesians, right. he says you're forgiven. In 1 John, he says you're a child. In 2 Corinthians, he says you are secured for all eternity. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 18, you know what he says about you? You are set free. Right. In yes. Isaiah, he says you're precious to him. In John, he says that you're set apart. He says says that you are a masterpiece, a vessel right. of honor set apart right. for a special purpose to be used by him, that he yeah. would be glorified in and through your life. That's you right. are no longer a slave. That's right. You're not a slave to sin. You're not a okay. slave to addictions. You're not, you're not a slave to anything that is holding you captive, but only because you've given it permission to. Come on, it's good. The God Come that on. is inside of you is so much bigger. So much bigger. That's right. If we'll only just realize who we are yes. in Him, That's you're good. chosen. Thank you, Jesus. You can do all things through mm-hmm. Christ who strengthens you. Do you God. know who you are? Do you have any idea who you are this morning? Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, God, we love you so much. We're so grateful, God, that, that you've, <laughs> you've called us, God, who believe to... Remain faithful to your teachings. And when we do, God, we we learn to know the truth, the reality of who we are in you. And God, we, we realize the truth is that we're not bound anymore. The truth is, is that we're, we're more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond what we can ask for or even think because of who you are in us. And I pray today in the powerful name of Jesus. God, that you would help us to look into the mirror, to help us see the truth. I pray, God, that you would help us to realize that we're free. All we have to do is break free because the Son has set us free indeed. Today, church, we're going to introduce to you a new worship song. I'd like for you at this time to stand up if you would and... What I want to do is I want us to declare this morning the freedom that God has given us. I I think it's important that we hear ourselves say who God says we are. We're chosen. We're not forsaken. We're free indeed. Let's sing.
I was talking about that rope being tied to your ankle. All you can see is that that, that rope really was keeping you from a real life-changing relationship with Jesus. Thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.